Hey guys, it's Ray and today we're going on a power trip. If you've seen my other videos, you know I have a lot of appliances in this minivan. I've got an AC powered microwave, air fryer, water kettle, and power tool battery charger. I've got a DC powered fan, water pump, TV, Starlink, CPAP machine, phone charger, electric blanket, and portable fridge freezer. Add to that my laptop, camera, wireless mics, battery charger, air pump, LED lights, and a dozen other USB devices. This minivan camper is power hungry. Today, I'll show you how I keep it fed. From 2.7 kilowatt hours of lithium battery and a 1000 watt inverter backup charger in inside the van to 300 watts of solar and 22 pounds of propane outside. I've got options. I have a watertight power port for shore power when I'm on the grid and a propane generator when I'm not. I can charge and recharge on the go anywhere, even in the middle of nowhere, like this national forest. I'll show you exactly what I have installed, how it all works, and how it's wired together. And speaking of wiring, we'll learn how to splice, crimp, heat shrink, and safely connect wires to a 12 volt fuse panel. We'll cover all that plus three tips to make your electrical system better. Are you ready to get wired? I am. Let's do this. First things first, here's a quick overview of my solar setup and my power system. I wanted tilting solar panels, so I mounted two large steel eye bolts to the top of my awning brackets. Thought being I could mount a solar panel to a steel pole, slide it into the eye bolts, providing a pivot point or a hinge. I used stainless steel bolts, washers, and nuts to connect three 100 watt solar panels together, making one large panel. I had to buy two Y branch wiring connectors to hook them together. If I had to do it again, I'd purchase a single 300 watt panel. Next, I cut two sections of three quarter inch steel conduit and wrapped them in black gaffer's tape to prevent rusting. You'll notice the pipe is about six inches wider than the panels on each side. I added plastic caps to keep water out. Then I mounted the pipes to the solar panels using small galvanized pipe hanger straps. So now I take this prop rod and I'm able to lift the solar panels all the way up. Another benefit to propping the solar panel up is having a direct angle to the sun once it starts dropping in the afternoon. I get a lot more watts in a day with them sitting up like this. So I took the solar wiring and I ran it through the back hatch at the top here and covered it with some white Gorilla tape that's waterproof and believe it or not this does not leak. And then it peeks in through here and wraps all the way down to the left side and then it carries across the bottom and then it goes underneath and into the Blue Eddy power station. And here's something I never thought I'd see on camera. Let's take a look at the junk in my trunk. First, I gotta get rid of all this stuff. Start over here on the right side, and under here is the power station. This is a Blue Eddy AC200 Max. I've got my AC inputs that run up to the sink module. One runs to the cube on the countertop. One is hidden right now, and it runs on the left side over to the microwave. Then I have some USB cables. One is a 100 watt power delivery here, and this runs to my computer up through the left side. It's hidden. Then I have two USBs that run over to the right side that power either one of those phone chargers that I have. Then this is a DC plug that goes to my CPAP machine that uh, has to run overnight. This is DC out. This is a 30 amp output that runs underneath everything up to the fuse panel. This panel provides circuit protection for all my 12 volt stuff, like my fridge and freezer, the water pump for my shower, my awesome window fan, and my little TV. On the back side of the fuse panel, I have a 1000 watt pure sine wave inverter that I use to charge the Blue Eddy when I'm driving or when I don't have enough sun for the solar. And just to be safe, I have a 200 amp inline circuit breaker between the inverter and the starter battery. I run an AC extension cord from the inverter to my Blue Eddy power station in the trunk, and I have a remote on off switch up front. If I don't have enough solar coming in or I just want to top up the portable battery, the inverter pulls about 470 watts from my main car battery and sends it back to charge the Blue Eddy. In the Blue Eddy app, you can see the charging watts from the Renogy inverter on the top right. That's a solar input on the left. I have to use this setup sparingly though because a stock car alternator really isn't designed to pump extra amps into an inverter. Occasionally the inverter will shut off and I'll get a low voltage warning. Pushing it too much will damage my starter battery. I probably need to invest in a high output alternator and pay for what's known as a big three wiring upgrade to make this reliable full time. Now under this hatch on the left side, this is the charger that I have for the Blue Eddy here. Another great thing about the power station is that I can monitor and control it via Bluetooth app. I can easily see how much solar is coming in and how much power I'm using. And probably the best thing is that I don't have to go outside and around to the back when I want to turn the AC inverter on and off. I can do it all from the phone. I shot that video over a year ago and since then I've upgraded my main power station. 
but both of them have similar features. Both have a 2000 watt inverter and a two kilowatt hour battery, but this one has one major upgrade. More on that in a minute. Also back here, I have a smaller power station. This one's 700 watt hours. I'm testing that one for an upcoming video to see how well it powers my CPAP machine and my Starlink mini satellite dish. So subscribe if you're interested in that video. Now back to that major upgrade in this new Blue Eddy. This one has the AC power adapter integrated inside the unit. My old one had an external AC adapter, which is okay unless my mistake was mounting the adapter in this cabinet under the coolers, which isn't really a problem unless you have a problem, but I had a problem. I've pulled over at this beautiful rest area in Corsicana, Texas, and I'm now going to try to troubleshoot why the Renogy inverter is not working. On a recent trip out west to meet Bob Wells from the Cheap RV Living YouTube channel, I was having problems charging the power station while driving, and I had to troubleshoot. Here's the inverter, and first thing I got to do is find out if there's power coming out of it. So I need to unplug. This is the cord that goes to the shore power to the Blue Eddy. I tested a few devices and the inverter was working. So, so I got to follow this cable all the way back underneath the, to the back. Adding to the drama, heat and humidity. What's the temperature outside? It's about 105 degrees outside. Okay, now here's something I'm not looking forward to. I got to move this out of the way and unload the entire back cargo be able to get to the blue eddy and everything else inside so wish me wish me luck i'll speed this video up to spare you the frustration but anytime i needed to check out anything in the trunk on that trip i gotta unload all of this junk to be able to get to everything i need to see to troubleshoot this so i had to swing open the cargo box and then unload the cushions pillows coolers you name it everything had to come out in the end it was a loose power cable going into the blue eddy external ac power adapter and that is actually loose that trip was tough my 12 volt fridge and freezer were both overheating and i had to unload all the cargo again in arizona for a different issue i have a video on that trip and all the troubleshooting i'll leave a link in the description anyway learn from my mistake Make sure your next power station doesn't have an external AC adapter. And if it does, don't mount it in a hard to reach place. Now let's talk about how I keep the power stations charged up. When I'm driving, I have the solar and I also have the Renogy inverter here. But when I'm camping, I have two other options. I can plug into the grid or I can plug into my portable generator. And to make that easier, I installed this waterproof power port right here in the rear hatch. These power ports are waterproof, rated at 15 amps, and made with heavy duty 14 gauge copper wiring. See my other videos for a detailed demo of how to safely install one of these. This is the cable coming from the power port, and this white cable goes to the Blue Eddy power in. I usually leave these plugged in together, and then I keep the hatch closed. Now I just have to plug in my extension cord and then plug it into the grid or out here into my portable generator. Let's get that set up. This 2200 watt portable generator weighs 45 pounds and it fits nicely inside my swing out cargo carrier. It's a bit of a lift to get it out, but not too bad. This is a dual fuel model so I can run it on gasoline too, but I prefer propane. I carry two 11 pound propane squatty body tanks and luckily I don't need a ladder to get these down. It starts pretty easily and it's not terribly loud. Pulling 1500 watts, I can charge my Blue Eddy in about an hour and a half. Having this generator is a real luxury. Now let's talk about wiring. I've taken everything out so we can get a better look and it all starts back here at the power station. All of the wires from the power station are tie wrapped together and they're mounted to the frame piece back here. There are a few cables that go over to the right side like you saw in the video, but most of the cables are bundled together and they curve up this way and then they go underneath the bed rail into some holes that I've drilled and they go into the cabinet underneath the coolers, but behind the microwave box. And then they wrap around the side of that microwave box and then they go straight up to the fuse panel. I showed you this in my tips and tricks video, but if you ever need to run a wire in a hard to reach place, tape it to the end of a long wood dowel and then just thread that dowel into the hole and shove it up as far as you can go. Then you grab that wood pole and you just pull it through and now you've got your wire. I use this trick to run wires from the front to the back for everything. While we're up front, I wanna show you something else. I have a few power cables that aren't connected while I'm driving. I just leave them down here behind the driver's seat. And when I set up for camp, I move my seats forward and that sink box is moved forward and then I can plug it in. So then I'll reach in and I'll plug in the power cable from the sink box to this power cable right here. Then I also have one for my Roku and for my TV and I plug those in right here. Then I have power going to everything. 
Okay, so we've talked about the power station and we've talked about running wires from back there to up here. And I've briefly talked about the fuse panel. Let's talk more about this. So if you have a power station that has DC outputs, why do you need a fuse panel? For me, it's two reasons. First, I wanted the ability to add more devices in the future. I had already used most of the inputs on my power station. And as you can see here, I already have nine connections. That's in addition to everything that's directly connected to the Blue Eddy. And the second reason I wanted a fuse panel was easy access. My power station is buried in the trunk under my bed cushions. And as we saw earlier, it's not quick and easy to get to. I have to unlock and swing open the cargo box, which means I have to be in an open space. There's not always enough room to open it in a regular parking spot. And that brings me to tip number two. If you're doing your own wiring, make sure you have easy access to your connections and your fuse panel because something will come loose or stop working and you'll need to get to it. My fuse panel is mounted to a thin wood board located just inside the driver's side sliding door. And tip number three is to label all of your wires on each end of the wire. This is non-negotiable. You might only have a couple of wires now, but it's a good habit to get into, especially if you plan to hardwire a bunch of devices or appliances later. This fuse panel would be a nightmare to work with if I didn't have everything labeled. Just get a cheap label maker like this, it's thermal, so it never needs ink, it just needs labels. Then you're gonna type a name into the free mobile app and hit print, and then bingo, you've got a label. Okay, we have a fuse panel installed and it's time to connect our devices. I already have a lot of connections here, so let's do a new one together right now so you can see how it's done. Today, we're gonna wire in my little travel router, and uh, this is just the wires been run all the way from inside to here, and now we have to use wire strippers and put in connectors so that we can fit them into the fuse panel and then properly fuse it for safety. So the tools that we'll be using today are a wire stripper for dummies. If you're an electrician, turn away now. But this is for dummies, uh, or if you really wanna make it quick and easy, this thing is amazing. Then the end connectors, I use this brand Wirefly, but you can use anything. They're color coded so you know the gauge of the wire is properly mat mated or matched or whatever. And it comes with a special wire crimper uh, made for this specific type of connector. Another type of wire crimper will not work. And they're color coded, so you have different sizes that fit in there. We have the blue, so today we'll crimp it in slot number two. That provides or assures a, a tight and exact crimp. Um, anyway, and then finally, after we've done that, we're gonna take this heat gun and we're gonna heat shrink it. A little portable mini heat gun. All right, so the first thing I gotta do is strip the wire. So I'm gonna come back up here to these two wires here, pick up my really, really simple, and you adjust the wire size, how the depth, there's a little blade right there, tiny thing there, and you measure from the blade to, the, to this red thing that can slide back and forth. That's a little uh, spacer. And so you slide that in there, and as long as you put it snug onto the uh, red little thing, and you, you press down, it's a perfect, strip every time. Twist these a little bit to make them tight so they don't fray. And you're just gonna shove that down into, and it'll snug it up in there, and then kind of hold it together. Now I drop my wire crimpers. I'm gonna go get them down here. So now I have my wire crimpers, and then you're gonna rest this. I had to reopen it right into the hole. Sorry, right there. And you're just gonna hold it. Now I have it held here. So now you slide that wire down into the crimper. Hold on one second. There it is, snugged in. Now I'm gonna push a little bit of pressure. Now I'm gonna squeeze the wire crimper like that, all the way in and let go. And now you have a perfect crimp on that thing. It's amazing uh, when you use the right tool for the right job. Now we just have to heat shrink that. So turn the heat gun on. And be careful not to touch your skin with this thing. And I'm just gonna aim it at this and you'll, if you watch, you'll see it start shrinking. The idea is just to heat shrink this thing. It takes a little while, and you want to twist the wire back around so that you can get a uh, even shrink on it. You can see it; it's starting to grab it. You can see the air going out of it here. It's looking really nice. Now we need to hook the connector to the panel. So first, you have to take these out. This is the negative post. We're going to take that out, and I'm going to take this right here and put it back in. And this is tricky. I'm trying to do this so we can see this too. Hold it, spin it tight. Okay, almost, almost, almost. There you go. Now I've already pulled out this post. I've already pulled out the post from the positive down here. Remember, I have no fuse in here. I also have my power shut off to the entire 12 volt panel because that's uh, 
just you just got to do that to be safe you don't want any power in the way but also i pull the fuse too just to make sure so this is really tricky man oh, got to get it in there i got to get an angle on this thing with my screwdriver sometimes that's tricky if you've ever done it but just a little delicate balance all right once we have that in okay so you can see that the positive comes to this slot right here shouldn't have done that don't stick your screwdriver in there even if the power is off anyway but now i'm ready and these are just used automotive fuses or marine fuses you can get these at any auto shop anywhere that's why i use these but this particular panel is a, a marine panel anyway um you take your fuse, pop it into here, and now you're ready as soon as you shove it in. So now we turn the power back on the 12-volt panel and test the router and make sure it's working. Okay, so now we know our DC power is on because my fan has come back on. I'll leave that on all the time. All right, the switch for the travel router is up here. I've, I've got a little on-off switch, and we're hoping to see a blue light, and there it is. That's great. All right, so it's wired over here, and here's the travel router's over here but I'm going to remove the light that goes to my stove. It's removable. Everything is magnetic and removable in this build. We need to see the front of this router to see the light lit up to make sure it's on. So I'll turn it over and there's the blue light and that's great. Now I'm going to look and see if the network is showing up. This is for my Starlink. So we should see RR Starlink show up and there it is. It's showing up in our network. So now we know that it is working. Put this back in slide it in these are amazing and reattach that and that's it we're done so that's it that's how we wire it fuse it and keep it powered if you got anything out of this video please like it and subscribe to the channel i'd really appreciate it until next time thanks for watching